Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and Nebraska Extension. Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we'll hear about local compost and our prairie installation at the State Fair. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host as we answer your gardening questions with our expert panel from Nebraska Extension. Answering our insect questions tonight, we have Michael Rethwish. Hello, Kim. We have turf questions going to Rock Aswa. Super duper to be here, Kim. Rots and Spots goes to Kevin Corris. Evening, farmers. And Kelly Feehan is our horticulturist tonight. Hello, all. You know, we'd love to hear your questions as well. If you need help with a garden issue, just give our volunteer phone panel a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 1-800-676-5446. If your question can wait or you want to send us a photo, you can send an email to byf at unl.edu, and it has to go to the email. When you send us an email, please do tell us as much information as you can, including where you live. During the week, you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and the Backyard Farmer website. So with that out of the way, let's look at some samples. And Michael, this is a pretty timely one and pretty teeny, which is what makes it timely. That's what makes it timely. <laughs> well, what we have here, this is a evergreen. This happens to be a spruce. And it looks like we've just got a little bit of small debris things right here. But actually, this, uh, these things right here are bagworms. And these are the first bagworm caterpillars I've seen this year. And so uh, now is a great time to control them. Uh, they're very easy to miss right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you've got uh, seeing bags on those evergreen trees from last year, it's a good time to be looking for them. And it, uh, I almost missed these tonight. So, so. what's the control? Uh, various controls at this point in time allow the BT sprays will do a great job because they're small. Uh, some people will, may go to something a much more uh, powerful like a synthetic pyrethroid or uh, um, acephate, something like that. But the BTs are probably obviously not going to disrupt things nearly as much. And so when they're really small, the BTs are what we're going to be recommending at this point in time. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And I don't know if our viewers could see it, but those bags were moving. Yeah. <laughs> time to spray. <laughs> All right, Rock, what do you have tonight? Um, I have uh, 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 purslane, and uh, this is common purslane. It's a little uh, flaccid right now, so it's, the leaves aren't laying quite out flat like they normally would. And many people know this is an edible um, plant. It's a uh, prolific grower in our gardens right now. Doesn't matter whether it's a vegetable garden or whatever. But I just want to briefly talk about two things that, that make it difficult to control. One is, and this is some great work that one of our grad students who is now on faculty with us, Chris Proctor did, but if you have just this much of the plant, you're gonna get another plant. And if you have this much, so if you chop it or hoe it, you're doing a really good job spreading this weed, so let's not be doing that. Um, you can try to pull it, it tends to break. Uh, some of the herbicides seem to work, something like Preen or, or um, some of the other pre-emergent herbicides works relatively well in the lawn and the garden. But the last thing that makes it really freakishly hard to control is the fact that you know plants like corn and soybean and flowers and whatever, they, they um, their stomates are open during the day to cool off and, and they close at night. And then that's when the carbohydrates and everything are converted. You know, you have the food thing and all the other cool stuff that photosynthesis does. The thing about purslane is, is that it, at night, it, some, when it, we get into the heat of the summer, it shifts from classical photosynthesis like plants and then it goes to what cactus do. Cool. So it's extremely drought tolerant. It's one of the few plants that we see commonly. There's a lot of plants in that in the group that can do that. But it can go from being a common photosynthetic plant to, oh wait, conditions aren't real good like now. Let's shut down during the day so we don't lose moisture, keep our stomates shut, and then reverse the process and use this different method of photos method of photosynthesis. So I think that's way cool. Um, difficult to control, don't hack them up. There's some herbicides you can use, but uh, really it's at this point in time, they get that big, that robust. And plus the fact that during the day, um, they're probably really not that receptive to any kind of herbicide you'll spray. You're pretty much stuck with them unless you uh, wanna hand pull them and be very, very careful when you do it. 
Or eat them. <laughs> or eat them, pull them and eat them, but make sure nobody has inadvertently sprayed them or intentionally sprayed them, because then you get 2,4-D as your dressing. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Kevin, you have a dead something. I do. This is a, a year-old hazelnut tree. So this was a seed a year ago, um, a year ago in the spring, and it grew this tall in a year. And then um, this last fall, what happened is that um, the tree went dormant, but it may not have froze, or the temperatures may not have gotten as cold as they needed to get right away. So what happened is that this fungus called Fomopsis attacked the plant and was able to infect the plant and essentially kill it. So this spring, um, the plant did not leaf out. And so what I want to show you is we're getting this great zoom action here. Oh, and now it goes away. But is that the fungus will... <laughs> <laughs> hey, ooh, and now it's back. Awesome. Um, so what the fungus will do is it'll produce these little black erumpent um, pustules, these fruiting bodies that'll come out of um, the bark. And that's a good indication that you may have had Fomopsis infect your plant and produce these spores. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do other than ensure that that plant is, is super healthy throughout the growing season before it goes into the fall and, and goes dormant. You want a good, um, a full lush root system on it and you want it to be able to to kind of um, go into dormancy as a healthy plant and that'll help protect against these um, invasive fungi. Normally when this tree is a, a full adult tree, this will just cause a small canker on, on the bark, on, on, uh, on the trunk. But since this is just a small seedling, it can actually take over the entire plant and, and kill it, which is what happened. So, All right, for those kinds of bad things. news for that poor little, little thing. Hazelnut. All right, Kelly, a couple of different tree species. Okay, okay. well, what, I brought a sample to sh be able to show you, demonstrate to you how we determine how much new growth a tree puts on. And this is kind of a diagnostic tool that we use to determine how vigorous or how healthy a tree is. I have a ginkgo here, and the way you tell, let's see there, you can tell the old, last year's growth or older growth is kind of, uh, kind of brown, or it might be tan, brown, whatever, depending on the tree, the species of the tree. And the new growth is always going to be very tender and usually light green. You can, here, we got almost a whole foot here on this slow growing ginkgo. <laughs> um, so you can distinctly tell the difference between last year's growth and the new growth this year. And if I bring in here, I have a green spire linden. And I think you can tell here, let me move some of the green out of the way. Same thing, you can kind of distinctly tell the difference between, there's usually a bud scar too, but it's the last year's wood is, is kind of brown and then this year's new growth is nice and green and tender. And we kind of use this as a diagnostic tool to determine how well a tree is doing. Now, green spire lindens are considered fast growing trees, but we only have about four inches of growth here. And that's, this tree I know has a girdling root which is very common with uh, green spire linden. Unfortunately, there's not much, nothing you can do about a girdling root once it occurs at planting time, you need to cut those girdling roots in place of it. And then the ginkgo's that nice. I know we've had a lot of good weather this year, but you've got that good foot, one foot of growth. Ginkgo's a great tree. A lot of people don't plant it because they think it grows slow. But if it's in the right place and the right condition, they can grow very well. But it's just a, a good way to kind of monitor your trees and determine um, you know, how well they're doing. And you probably want, it depends on the, the weather, uh, the, where the tree's planted, the species of the tree, uh, but around 12 inches of growth is, is probably pretty good. Some trees you'll have two foot or more. Um, other trees, you know, six inches might be normal. All right, thanks, Kelly. Michael, you get uh, the first picture, and this is actually one that uh, went into Omaha. Okay. And they think it is translucent oak gall wasp. So there it is looking like cool. So what is it and what to be done about it? It is definitely a gall and it is uh, this year's growth. Uh, and if it was been last year's growth, it wouldn't have a, a green leaf, obviously. And there's also would be a small hole in it where the wasp had come out. Uh, that's usually what happens in the spring and then uh, it wasp has laid its egg into the new leaf and you see the growth that's coming out there now. There's lots and lots of different galls Mm -hmm. on oaks, and this is just probably about the biggest one that we will see out here, so it's really cool. Can't do anything about it, just enjoy it. <laughs> there you go, perfect. Okay, Rock, a North Platte viewer has said, what is this, how do I annihilate it? She's tried Spectrum, Preen, Roundup, only wilts it, it laughs in her face. She has pulled it, it grows on the ground, up through everything and around everything. <laughs> I would, it's a bindweed, filled bindweed, and it's a very tenacious weed, as the name implies, 
find it, especially like in junipers and other things, it'll get up into their plant material and uh, pretty tie up and get it all around it. Um, and so control is really difficult, as she's already <laughs> indicated. Our suggestion is, and it's, you gotta be very careful with this mixture, okay? But our suggestion is a mixture of 2,4-D and Roundup together. Now, if you wanna be, if it's not all, all over the place and you don't, you know, you're not filling up the 200 gallon sprayer, what we suggest you do is you get the ready to use uh, Roundup or glyphosate containing materials and then something that contains 2,4-D and it can be a, a Trimec or something like that, but we'd prefer maybe a standalone 2,4-D product. And you take it and it's ready to use, so you just squirt it on to your gloved hand. You've got a plastic glove on, glove of death, as Zach Reich used to call it, and you've got the cotton glove on it, and then you just reach and re you very lightly, you don't want to pull on it um, too excessively, and you just, as you pull up and squeeze a little bit, it's gonna put that on there. That seems to work very effectively. It may take multiple applications, but the viewer is exactly right. Um, Roundup by itself doesn't seem to do much to fill bindweed. All right, and it's, it's gonna be a long-term commitment. Well, you and, you and the bindweed are gonna get to know each other very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Kevin, it's been a great year for cedar apple rust. This is actually a viewer who has a red delicious, uh, and then they have a, um, a Jonathan, and one looks way better than the other one, and they're wondering what mm. in the world is going on with yeah. the apples. Yeah, that's a great example of plant resistance. So yeah. the red delicious is obviously loaded with, with lesions there, and the Jonathan is not. So. Um, Interestingly enough, the Jonathan is actually super susceptible to fire blight, which we've had a lot of this year. Luckily, I don't see any in those photos. But um, so, uh, you know, what we do to prevent this is there are some fungicides um, that are available. And there's a great NEB guide um, that we have here um, discussing the products that are available to the homeowner that are only commercially available and, and, and their efficacy and all that. And so there are fungicides that need to be applied, but they need to be applied preventatively. And so a great way to time when those fungicides need to be applied is looking at the cedar trees, right? So this is cedar apple rust. And the other host um, for this fungus is a cedar tree. And so when you see those brown balls, of those, those weird looking galls on the cedar trees produce those nasty looking snotty orange tendrils in the spring, those are the spores being released that will cause your apples to look like that. So that's when you want to apply the preventative fungicide to your apple trees. Um, you also wanna, when those leaves do fall in the fall, get rid of them and burn them or bury them or, or make sure you remove those because you'll help reduce the amount of fungus in the environment. So. And those are some pretty nasty leaves on that tree. <laughs> Remind me not to eat before backyard next week because of the <laughs> snotty, <laughs> slimy, mucusy. Thank you so much. All right, Kelly, <laughs> this is a carny viewer that has a maple with bark that is splitting on the trunk. Uh, they first noticed it only about the middle of June. It's spread up. There's a Senka split. He says it's an emerald queen maple, so it's in Norway about 10 to 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what is causing the damage? And I think we had two or three other viewers that are now mm -hmm. sending in questions about okay. maples doing exactly this. Okay, well, most likely it is a frost crack. And we, we see those usually on the south or southwest side of the tree. And there's, you know, during the winter, the sun beats on that bark. And usually we see it on younger maples first. So mm -hmm. it may be, maybe they've had a small crack there. And just because of the extreme weather that we've had the last couple of years, possibly the crack has gotten larger. But when a frost crack occurs, when the sun beats on it during the day, and um, there's some, you know, discrep some people believe it's because the, the cells uh, become active and expand. And then when it gets cold at night, the outer bark, can, you know, it constricts faster than the inner bark and that causes the crack. There's some, there's some that believe the outer bark, it's actually water moving out of the cell and the outer bark um, dries out quicker and that's what causes, and the inner bark stays moist and that's what's causing the cracking. But either way, it has to do with um, winter and winter temperatures and the sun beating on that bark. There really, as long as the tree stays healthy up above, there's really nothing you can do. You shouldn't cover it um, with any kind of a tree wrap in the summer anyway, because you can get moisture trapped behind there and that can promote decay. Insects can get in behind there. Um, so we don't recommend doing anything with it. <clears throat> if it is a frost crack, it should close during the summer. So it is a little bit odd that they're just noticing it in June because they typically close. Um, the other thing I was noticing is the bark almost looks kind of loose around there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm wondering if there may not be just a little bit more going on, but time will tell, but you really have to wait and see. There's not much you can do at this point. All right, thank you, Kelly. 
Well, just a reminder that this is the International Year of Soil and there's nothing better you can do for your soil than adding organic matter like compost. One local company is reusing its waste products and producing compost and that's Prairieland Dairy. Our first feature tonight takes a look at taking waste and making garden gold. Well, the dairy's been in operation since the early 1920s. Uh, we started with, with just a few cows, and uh, we started really expanding in 1998. Uh, we built ourselves up to about 700 cows in the year 2000. And then in 2004, we gained uh, two more families, and we doubled our herd size to 1,400. And that was in the year of 2004, and in 2005, we decided we had to do something with our manure, and we wanted to do something sustainable, um, so we came up with composting. Uh, so we started composting in 2005. We've been composting ever since. And then the last couple years, we've really started to incorporate um, outside organic waste into that, into that compost. Because we figure, you know, we're, we're trying to make ourselves sustainable, but we also want to help other companies be sustainable as well and um, keep that stuff from going to the landfill. And we figured out that about 80% of the stuff that goes into landfill is compostable. So if we can pull a percentage of that out, then we can um, save, our, save our soils for the next generation. Our outside organic material, uh, most of it comes from in industries, uh, food plants, pet food plants, um, any kind of scrap food material they have. Uh, we get a lot from the grocery stores. Um, we pick up from all the local Super Savers and Russes, and then also all the local Hy-Vees that we pick up their um, organic waste from there. And then we also do some schools. Uh, we do about six LPS schools right now, so they're saving on their trash as well. So the process is we bring in the organic waste from the outside. Uh, we mix it in with our manure right away. We start letting that um, break down. It'll break down for um, two or three days until we get it good and soft, and then we'll take it out and we'll lay it in our, in our windrows. And that's when the compost process really begins. We let the bugs uh, heat up and the bugs start doing their thing. What our goal is, is to keep the bugs alive. So we monitor the temperature, oxygen, and moisture on a daily basis. And if our temperature starts dropping or anything, we need to turn our row. We need to oxygenate our bugs. So we have a turner, what we call a compost turner or an aerator. Uh, we go down through the rows. Our, our goal there is to throw every particle of compost up into the air to get a bit of oxygen. We'll give all the bugs oxygen and keep them alive and they'll do their thing for about six to eight weeks, depends on the ambient temperature. Um, and then we'll take it over, we'll, we'll pile it here for about nine months to a year and let it cure. And then we'll sell it to the consumers. Uh, we believe it's, the soil is more important than the actual plant. We want to take care of our soils so that the soils can take care of the plants. Commercial fertilizers, uh, they focus mainly on the plant, whereas if we use our compost, which is, which is a soil amendment, what we're doing is we're building up that soil so we really get good microbial activity in the soil, and our soil can take care of our plants. And we'll do it the all natural way rather than using commercial fertilizers to take care of the plants. You know, it's wonderful to hear about how Prairie Land is taking things that would go to the landfill and making something useful out of them. And you don't have to have a dairy to do the same thing in your backyard on probably a little bit smaller scale. <laughs> Unless you've got a lot of something or others. All right, Michael, you get the next picture okay. questions. And we have two or three people that have sent in pictures of the same thing. Northwest Omaha and uh, the other one is Cairo, Cairo, Nebraska. 10 to 15 year old, they're seeing this on the end. They think it's a fungus, but is it the fungus among us or is it an insect? This to me looks to be an insect. Mm -hmm. And looking at this, we've got uh, two, actually two different insects involved in this particular picture. We'll talk about the curled leaves first. And there we have, a, there's a leaf curl ash aphid, which is probably causing this. There's also a woolly uh, ash aphid as well. Um, these will cause a kind of distortion of the leaves, but really it's not too much of a problem. The other thing in this particular picture, if you look in the top right, uh, you'll see a big chunk chewed out of it, and that's probably being caused by ash sawfly. Hmm. And we've seen a lot of activity of, of, uh, in the ash trees in my area 
uh, there are a lot of holes chewed into the leaves as well. So we've, we've got two or three things happening, but the curled leaves, definitely aphids. And not much you can really do at this point. Enjoy it. I mean, it's not going to hurt the tree. It makes it look funny, but uh, it's not going to hurt the trees any. All right. Thank you, Michael. Rock, it's weed night for the turf guy. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer, and she says this popped up this spring, and it popped with a vengeance. And she is wondering, what is the beastie, and how do you control it? That's uh, um, pokeweed, and or a poke cherry, or it, there's a number of different names for it. And it's called poke cherry because it looks, especially when we get closer to the fall and the winter, you know, puts out a very grape-like, small grape like looking berry. A um, couple of things you need to know about this. One is, you know, it's an amazing attractant for wildlife. It's, it's fantastic for that. It also is one of the major places for one of the major moths, the big, big fat ones, whatever. I can't remember what it is. It's a critter of some kind, whatever. Um, that's not really important in the whole biological thing. But what, so what is important is understand those berries are poisonous and young children will think they look, you know, really yummy. They'll pop them in their mouth and they, you know, they, there's not fatalities associated with it, but it, but it can make a child very ill. And, and the leaves themselves are actually, uh, they used to be used as a food source. You could, you have to boil them twice to extract um, the, the toxin in them. So, you know, they're great in the back 40 or back away from the house where you're not gonna have children and um, other adults playing around them. And they are a great attractant for wildlife, squirrels, birds, etc. But uh, um, just be aware of that. And then birds are what actually spreads them. So it doesn't surprise me that maybe a bird um, you know, ate a berry. The berries have about 20 seeds in them. It passes right through their midgut all the way out the, out the butt back end. I almost said something else. <laughs> almost <laughs> the, back, the back end and the seed's still viable. As a matter of fact, that's a scarification. They drop to the ground and next thing you know, we've got a, a, another pokeweed growing. So real common, uh, real prolific seed production. Um, just watch out for the poisonous berries. All right, excellent. Thank you, Rock. Uh, Kevin, this is an ID of a bitty fungus, and mm -hmm. they found this growing kind of in a little mulch area, and I think they're most intrigued with the things that look like little round gray Cheerios. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> to be honest, I, I have no idea what that is. I know it's a cup fungus of some sort, mm -hmm. and it's a cup fungus that probably likes pine wood, and I'm guessing there's um, a, a bunch of you know, their stem or a log or some bark or some kind of wood from the pine tree. I, I believe they mentioned that they saw that between right. two ponderosa pines. Right. That is decaying and, and it's a cup fungus. So um, there are several different classifications of fungi, but we have uh, two major groups, the basidiomycetes, and they, um, they create our typical, um, the cap and stock fungus. So the mushrooms we eat and the, and the um, fairy ring we see in our yard, those are basidiomycetes. This is probably an ascomycete, which produces its spores in an ascus, or sometimes a cup or a sack. And, and so that's what it is. I, I, I don't know genus and species on it. Very difficult um, without maybe sending in a sample, um, but it's a cool, neat little fungus um, decaying the wood in your yard. Cool, very good. Looks like a little bird's nest. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kelly, uh, bad year for roses. <laughs> This is a, a Lincoln viewer, I believe, yes. And three, three of them, approximately six years old, they flourished um, until this year. And then about, and they looked like this, and then about two thirds of the plant croaked, and then they went yellow, and then all sorts of things have happened. So uh, what, okay. are, what are we gonna say about this one? Okay, well, I, I believe that first picture was like a couple of years ago. It, so it wasn't necessarily this spring, right. if I remember correctly. Right. And so most likely it was winter kill. What was brown coming out of the winter, that was winter kill. It should have been all pruned down. The yellowing now, it's a nice clean yellowing. I don't see any black spots, so no disease. Doesn't look chlorotic, so I'm guessing from all the moisture that Lincoln had, because it was in Lincoln, correct? Right. So the soil was probably just very, very wet. And all you can do is really prune whatever's dead, whatever doesn't look correct, prune it all out and see what happens next spring. Hopefully yes. it'll be better. And hope we get one inch of timely rain instead of six right. inches. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, most people have already purchased their annuals to plant around their landscapes. But around this time of year, garden centers, box stores, and pretty much everybody is offering a number of annuals at pretty discounted prices. For this week's green and growing tip, we're going to tell you what to look for if you're shopping for bargains. This is the time of year when a lot of the annuals go on sale in garden centers all over the state of Nebraska. Great time to buy them, but you do have to pay a lot of attention to how you're going to manage them in your landscape so they don't just immediately keel over on you. 
What typically has happened is they're in a small four or six pack and completely root bound, just like this celosia is. This one's actually been watered recently, but what you'll discover is that these dry out extremely quickly. And it, when you go to put them in the garden, you're gonna have to tease that root mass apart, make sure it has good interface with the surrounding soil and probably water even as much as a couple of times a day until they get established. The other thing you'll see is oftentimes, and again, because that root mass is so bound up in the soil, you'll find that maybe you've got some nutritional deficiencies going on. Annuals can be pretty heavy feeders anyway if you want to keep them really healthy. And the yellowing leaves are one of the things that indicates that we might want to add a little bit of nitrogen to these particular vincas. So go ahead and purchase these. Take a good look at what you're buying. Make sure the plants overall look healthy. Put them in the soil properly. Take the time to do it right and you'll have great annuals until that late freeze in the fall. It's a matter of having a good eye and knowing what to look for that can make a world of difference when you take those bargain plants home. If it's got a problem at the store, it's unlikely that it's gonna get better at your house. So hopefully we'll be able to keep those alive because they are going out to raising Nebraska outdoors in the middle of July <laughs> of all times. Speaking of Grand Island, you get the next okay. question, Michael. Uh, a viewer saw a moth for squash vine. Oh, I'm sorry, you get the Twitter question. What was Twitter I thinking? Question. Okay. This is at Piano Girl 1967 sent this one in. How can we treat our cherry tree so the fruit doesn't have worms in it next year? I don't think that's <laughs> possible because the fruit have not been formed yet for next year. So you can't protect next year's fruit. This year it's kind of impossible. So what do they do next year? early. Is there something they can do early? It depends upon the, the pest. Are we dealing with a, a maggot? Are we dealing with a moth? Um, it depends upon the pest. And I think we probably need to have the pest identified first before we can really give a good recommendation on what to do. Excellent. So maybe one of those big old fruit sprays that contains everything is your best bet? Maybe? If you want to just not to get anything identified, that's possible. Okay. All right. Not necessarily the best. <laughs> Rock, you're not going to like this one either. This is a viewer with volunteer trees along the property line. After three and a half years of battle, he's down to the stumps. He's cut below grade and applied Tordon. Now he's wondering if the Tordon will kill the dogwoods and the azaleas that he intends to plant where the stumps are. Tordon has a very long soil residual. Um, okay. it's, an, it's, it's very good on cut stumps and so I'm, I'm thinking the stumps will be dead. But the trouble is, is that the wood that it's translocated in, the soil, um, you know, there's some exudates that form. And we often see it when, in, when in contact even with a stump that's been treated with Dordon and a Dordon and a distant plant, an adjacent plant can actually show some of the symptoms as well. So I, you know, I'm gonna say yes and say that I would take a bet out on that if a bookie would take it. Um, but I, I, you know, the only way to know is to stick something in the ground and see. But I, you know, they, if they haven't put the plants in yet, I would say not to, not to and then wait and, you know, wait a year or two and then take some of that up and, and put some sort of indicator plant on there, a small seedling or something, and see what happens. Uh, I'm, I'm not real um, sh sure of myself that they're going to be able to plant anything in there for several years. All right. Thank you, Rock. Kevin, this is an Aurora viewer that has uh, something that's a fungicide and it's been in the garage for a couple of years. They wonder if it's any good. They're saying it probably has frozen. Um, I, don't, I don't think that freezing will necessarily have an effect on it. I'm, I suppose there's a shelf life that is addressed on the label. If you no longer have the label of that fungicide, um, it, you know, I, all, all I'd be saying was a guess. Uh, it's probably still efficacious if it's only been a couple of years. And freezing, I wouldn't worry about. If it got too hot, I'd be worried that the chemicals were maybe denatured. But I, I think freezing may be okay. Um, again, that's a complete guess. But uh, I would try to use it and see if you have any efficacy with the product. <laughs> I, I think it depends probably on the chemistry too because For sure. sometimes freezing will hurt some and some it won't. So it depends, like you're saying, with the chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, thanks can, guys. Kim, can we go back to the Tordon question? Sure. I just, I want to make sure that they understand that it's, it's not a lost cause and they are working with plants 
you know, dog wouldn't expose it to azaleas that would be hypersensitive. So if they haven't bought the plants yet, don't buy them. But if they've already bought them, then they need to find another place to hold them until they ultimately get them in there and maybe uh, worry about that later. But I, I didn't, I came across as flippant and I didn't mean to. I just want to make sure they understand that, that it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a crapshoot and I would not be confident in the end result. All right, and excellent. Then, and I do want to go back to the cherry question, too, because we're, we know the spotted wing drosophila really likes cherry oh, as a yeah. host. And so early spring applications of, of poly is not going to be effective against that particular pest. So like I said, we need to know what the pest is first to really know what we need to do. All right, excellent, guys. Uh, this is a Hickman viewer, Kelly, and they have a mature shellbark hickory loaded with nuts, and then within one to two days, 80 to 90 percent of the nuts were on the ground, and they were healthy when she opened them. It happened last year too. What's up with the shedding that much of its crop? Okay, and it's shedding. If it is it shedding them in June? Well, and it must be doing it right now because okay. it was loaded with nuts, and then they just. This is a call-in okay. question. If, if, so. if they're quite, I mean, if they're quite small, then sometimes it may be that they were not fully pollinated, and with all the rainy weather and whatnot this year, that that may be. A reason, but then she said she'd opened them and they looked fine. Right. Um, you know, I, the only thing, other thing, is sometimes trees, we, we, fruit trees especially, we have a June drop where they'll drop excessive loads, uh, but they usually don't drop everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, either they weren't fully pollinated correctly, or there was just a, you know a June drop. Maybe there's something else going wrong with that tree and it just can't support it. Unless somebody else has any other ideas, but I not think, much you can do. I think that's about the right idea, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, our garden has responded really well to the warm weather we've been having here in Lincoln. Right now, we're going to take a minute to feature some of the wonderful blooming flowers out in the backyard farmer garden. It's amazing what a few days of heat do in the backyard farmer garden. Our master gardeners and Carol and staff have been doing a fabulous job of taking care of it. They have the drip line down. You can see that our pumpkins are flowering. Our Cheyenne spirit cone flowers from last year are beautiful. So is the common milkweed in full flower and full scent. Fabulous for those butterflies. We've got some basil that is actually beginning to flower, so we'll have to pinch that back. But a really cool thing that most people have probably not seen is the lower areas of our rain chain, we have a couple of plants blooming that are spectacular. The pink one is Philopendula, which is a native, and the red one is a selection of bee balm called Jacob Klein. And then on the hill, we also have another bee balm, which is also a native. So beautiful things that are in kind of the lower areas of the rain chain. Great success in the backyard farmer garden with our vegetables. That's what's happening this week in the backyard farmer garden. We need to take a short break, but stay with us. We've got the plant of the week and the lightning round coming up right after these messages. Welcome back to Backyard Farmer. You still have time to get your questions answered. Just give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. Later on in the show, we're going to feature our new prairie area out at State Fair. Right now, it's time to start the lightning round. You ready, Kelly? I'm ready. <laughs> All right, we have a viewer who wants to know whether they should trim their tomatoes or can to be able to make them fill out at the base as opposed to just shooting up straight in the air. Okay, no, I, I would not trim them back. I mean, there are some people that will tr pinch out the suckers and the fork, um, but other, otherwise I wouldn't do any pruning. All right. Hands. Okay. Um, we have a Shenandoah, Iowa viewer who wants to know about transplanting the sprouts off raspberries. When to do that and how far apart should they be oh, placed? Do, uh, do it in early spring, ideally, and a foot apart. All right. We have a viewer that has a witch hazel that's half dead. Should they go ahead and prune those dead twigs out now? Yes. 
How do you start an apricot from a pit and get the same old apricot you had before? Well, you won't get the same apricot, but if you want to start it, you want to hold it in the refrigerator in some moist peat moss for the, win for the winter and then plant it next spring. But it won't be the same apricot. All right. Lots of viewers say their bleeding hearts are yellowing already. What's up with that? Well, they're probably naturally dying back. Um, they, they bloom and then they, they go dormant for the summer. Can you use mocha or other flavored coffee grounds in yes. your compost? Yes, you can. And just imagine how good those chocolate plants are going to taste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, you ready, Kevin? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we have a viewer who has a 30-year-old apple and thinks they've seen scaly dead bark on it. Is mm -hmm. this fungus or is it normal for some apple trees? Um, it could be a canker. It could be the death of the tree. You might want to prune at ground level. <laughs> okay. <laughs> scaly bark. <laughs> We have another one who has uh, mushy, sunken spots on their tomatoes and their peppers. Should they be eaten or tossed? You could probably cut that part out and then eat the rest. All right. Um, if, if pears, ornamental pears, have really thin foliage and thin branches and spots, will fertilizing them get rid of the problem? Um, no. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. What, what do we attribute sudden death in crab apple branches to right now? Um, probably a canker of some sort or possibly fire blight okay. that would have started a while ago. All right. Are we seeing early blight in potatoes already? Yes, you could be. Uh-huh. And is there anything that can be done about early blight in potatoes? There are some fungicides. Remove the leaves that have lesions. All right, and aster yellows is showing up. Any hope for plants with aster yellows? Nope, no curative, just rogue them out. See, we're getting him in the seven. mood by saying, Kevin, just answer the question. We helped him. We helped <laughs> him. <laughs> you cheated. Well, I don't care. And, four, four, and, and foreheads going like this. <laughs> okay, Rock, are you ready? <laughs> no, I don't know if I can, I don't want to compete against that. <laughs> well, answer slowly then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we, have, we have a viewer who has a uh, yellowing of turf in great big large swat, swaths, not little patches. Is that nutritional potentially? Or? Um, it could be nutritional if the lawn's irregular in, in elevation and it tends to be in the low spots. It's probably uh, denitrification or it could be anthracnose, which should have gone to him. Okay, we have another viewer I'm who sorry, has... not anthracnose, uh, um, whatever it's called. What's the one I'm thinking of? <laughs> we have musk thistle in the lawn. How in the world do you control that? Um, I'd, I'd actually cut it out and then just keep an eye on the taproot. All right, what kills moss in a lawn? Um, actually, if you take Dawn liquid soap and spray it on there at about a 50-50 with water, you'll burn it back, but it doesn't have a vascular system, so it's just going to sporulate and irritate you for the rest of your life. Okay. This is a Fordyce viewer who wonders if it's too late to treat clover in bluegrass. Um, you're right on the edge of too hot, um, but I, it's better to treat it in the fall anyway. Okay. How soon can you uh, reseed after you've used a pre-emergent on your lawn? Depends on the pre-emergent. Okay. And if a... Uh, almost. Stop. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Time's up. I heard the thunder. <laughs> okay, are you ready, Michael? Oh Do I have God. a choice? Nope. Okay, I All guess right. I'm ready then. So last week we had a question from Grand Island about millers. This week we have multiple questions about many, many millers. How can you stop them? Well, you can't stop them. There's lots and lots of them. Turn your lights off. They're, they're usually attracted to lights, but uh, that's not usually going to be possible for all people. You really can't control them. Caterpillars are what you can control. All right. Is there such a thing as an Endelman pine moth, and will it affect spruce? There probably is. I can't say with certainty, but well, it probably sounds good. So a pine moth affects spruce? Maybe. Okay. Will garlic spray deter thrips or midges in roses? Have you heard of using garlic spray? People use garlic sprays. I don't know the efficacy on how good that's going to be. Sometimes there's big differences by thrip species. Okay. There are uh, a, a plain view viewer has half inch to three quarter inch black insects all over the place. What are those? 
Uh, sandy soil, Plainview area has dipped up there this week. A uh, species called Dysonetus piscipes uh, doesn't have a common name. Attracted lights, does lots of damage to turf anymore, and lots of other things. All right, nice job, all. Randomly strange, it's Kelly. Ask a kind of leaf blight. It wasn't anthracnos. I, I do want to correct the viewers because I correct myself, okay. and and I right. don't think we should ever let you on the show ever again. <laughs> So loser. So loser, you betcha. <laughs> All right, Kelly. What did Gladys bring us that is so pretty? Well, Gladys today? brought us, as usual, um, a beautiful plant. Maybe you can see it better this way. And um, usually she brings the perennials, but the yellow here is actually a tree. This is golden rain tree. And these are smaller trees, um, they're about a zone five. Um, I know sometimes we have issues with them in Columbus and north of Columbus, but I bet they do great around the Lincoln area. And these will get it, the yellow flowers will turn into, um, I don't know what you call them, they almost look like a capsule, they're kind of papery, but the clusters of them that hang down. So it's a compound leaf tree, it's very, uh, very pretty, even the leaf is very pretty, I can't find one here. But a beautiful tree, zone five golden rain tree. And of course the red flower is a bee balm, one of our Monardas. And we have a native one that's kind of light lavender or purple, um, but they, especially the, the, the native ones, there's just a lot of interest as it being a wildflower and how the Native Americans and how the pioneers use them, making tea out of them, Oswego tea and so on. Um, so just Monarda is a beautiful, there's many different kinds of Monarda. This one, um, she doesn't list the name of this particular one. Um, but there's many different kinds of Monardas. And the main thing when you're buying a Monarda is try to find one that's resistant to powdery mildew. Exactly. So thanks to Gladys as always. And the golden rain trees are beautiful in Lincoln right now. They've used them in a lot of very nasty, desolate sites and they do just fine. Okay, Michael, you get the next picture question. Um, this is a really cool picture. It's on a red bud and she found these little things that look like thorns on a branch and then you flick and they fly. And she wonders what they are and whether they're harmful. In high numbers, perhaps. What we have here are called uh, thorn mimic tree hoppers. <laughs> and you can see why they get their name. They've got the thorn on it. There's lots of different species of these, uh, uh, but um, these are thorn mimic tree hoppers. Uh, they'll put their beak into the, um, to the uh, branch and, or the twig and suck out juices is how they feed. They can be, I suppose, in certain situations, they're very high numbers. They can be problematic, but generally they're not problems. But occasionally they can be. All right. Thank you, Michael. Rock, uh, this is, we had two or three viewers with this question. Uh, one from David City, and it's a weed in the hostas, and another one uh, with uh, this particular weed in turf. They wonder what it is and how to control it. This is one of the plantains, I'm thinking broadleaf, just based by its appearance. Um, it's uh, atypical of broadleaf weeds in that it has parallel leaf venation. Oh, this is the hosta picture. Mm -hmm. I had to look at this one really close to tell which was the hosta and which was the plantain, but um, it's clearly growing in there. You can, the seed stock on it is pretty prevalent in this picture here. Uh, control in the lawn is relatively easy with any of the standard um, tr three-way type products. Control in the hostas is a little bit more problematic because it's really actually kind of related based on leaf structure to those things that would be harmful to the hosta as well. But maybe something, um, I'm, I'm speculating that maybe one of the lawn pre or excuse me, the garden pre-emergence like preen or preen garden or something like that might do it. And also know that it, it from an from a uh, IPM standpoint, it, it likes open turf. It also likes unmulched beds. So there's no reason not to mulch your hostas. I know there's some issues with, you know, the, the snails and stuff. But the bottom line is, is I'd mulch them and try to keep them uh, from for next year. This year, you're pretty much just going to have to watch them grow. But uh, you can hand weed them out if you want. Um, um, you can put them in, do pre-emergent in the in the spring for both the garden and the lawn, get the lawn healthier, and also consider um, throwing some mulch in and around the mulch, the hostas. Excellent, thank you, Rock. Kevin, darn pears anyway. Mm -hmm. Three or four questions this week, mm -hmm. and it just seems to be getting worse. Right, yeah, so these are ornamental pears, and 
here's the thing. It's very difficult to distinguish between what this might be. There are two things that can do this. Pear rust and entomosporium leaf spot. And it is actually important to differentiate between the two because there are fungicides that are available that are efficacious in preventing this from happening. So if you have a young tree or if you're getting continuous infection year after year, you might want to think about a fungicide application in the spring to prevent this. Um, so identification might need to happen. You might need to submit a sample to the clinic because the only way to tell the difference is by the spores that these fungus produce and they're completely different. But the symptoms <coughs> are almost identical. Um, you, you saw them in the photo, uh, yellowish to reddish, orangish, really very obvious spo um, lesions with really dark dots in the center. And both um, fungi will produce those, uh, those symptoms. So difficult to determine which is which. When the leaves fall in the fall, um, get rid of them. So sanitation is good um, to help reduce the amount of, of these fungi in the environment. And again, if you are thinking about um, a fungicide application, you might want to diagnose this because uh, the products to control each one are different. All right, thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kelly, this is a Lincoln viewer who has a pin oak, mm -hmm. probably planted in early 90, and, and you can see it <laughs> right there. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. steep grade, very, very chlorotic. She wonders what can be done about this. Mm -hmm. uh, leaves are yellow and weathered. There's been some injection done, iron treatment, didn't seem to make a difference. Um, what do we have going on here? Well, it, you know, look at the leaf up close, and if the leaf is uh, yellow, but the veins are dark green, then that, that would confirm that it is an iron chlorosis, most likely due to our high pH soils that are preventing the uptake um, of iron just by that pin oak tree. And, you know, it's, I guess I'd ask her what time of the year that the injection treatment was done, because if, if it was done in midsummer or fall, then maybe try a spring treatment. Um, on that size of a tree, um, probably either a trunk injection or that you could, there is a soil treatment. If you actually go to the Nebraska Forest Service website and look under, at their publications and scroll down, there's a very nice pamphlet there on uh, chlorosis of trees in eastern Nebraska. And there's some great information in there on how to do a soil treatment. Um, otherwise, I would try an injection treatment again. It should work. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Well, over the years, we've shown you just how beautiful the Nebraska prairie is. What might look like brown weeds from the window of your car as you drive down the interstate is actually an amazing collection of grasses, wildflowers, and shrubs. We recently installed a prairie area outside our new building at the State Fair, and Elizabeth Killinger is here to tell us more. the outdoor learning area located in front of the Nebraska building at Fauner Park in Grand Island. What we have in this area are we have a prairie, which I'm standing in front of now, we have a rain garden area, and then we also have native and adapted species here. In the prairie, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is this prairie was planted in 2012. A prairie takes about five to six years to get established. So in that initial year, um, what you're gonna have in a prairie is you're gonna have a lot of weeds, um, not the good kind of weeds um, that are pretty. We're looking at cheatgrass, we're looking at some mustards, we're looking at other weeds that are undesirable. You want the plants to go through that natural succession. Um, you want the weeds to be there the first year and you want the prairie plants to start to take over. So in a managed landscape, you want that to actually happen um, you want the weeds to be there and we have to go through and we have to maintain the plants are a little bit more aggressive. Those plants are a little bit more weedy. Um, the issue we have out here is because it's a site of state fair, we have to make sure that it looks good year round. It has to look good regardless if it's year one or year five or year six. Um, having a prairie like this in your home landscape is something that is great. Um, it allows for great species diversity. You um, can get pollinators there. And then it also adds for season long interest because a lot of these plants will be here th standing tall throughout the winter. And then we'll have um, some early spring bloomers in here as well. Unlike the rain garden outside of Kaim Hall, this rain garden has been in ground for about three years. One of the things that's always constant with a rain garden, whether it's newly established or it's fairly well established, is you're always gonna have weeds, you're gonna have to deal with management and maintenance of the site, um, you're also gonna have to deal with pests. Last year in this landscape, we had voles really bad. So in addition to keeping the weeds under control, we also need to work on keeping the voles and other critters under control as well. You can see this garden and the other gardens out here 
uh, during State Fair. Backyard Farmer will be at State Fair on September 2nd, and you can come see all these gardens in their fall glory. This installation is really a wonderful way to learn how to incorporate prairie plants into your own home landscape. It does indeed take some patience and some weeding, but once it's established, it can really be breathtaking. All right, Michael, uh, this is a Council Bluffs viewer who found some of these critters in the bottom of his watering can. He's never seen them before. What are they? This is a burying beetle. Huh. Um, it's not the American burying beetle, which is an endangered species. Uh, the, the oval area right behind the head would be orange if that's the case, and they're restricted more to the sand hills of Nebraska. But they're burying beetles, uh, hence their name, they find dead animals and they bury them, they lay their eggs on them, and then the uh, immature stages develop on the, on the uh, dead corpse <laughs> that's in the ground. <laughs> Very cool, all right, kind of. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a viewer. I fight dead people. <laughs> <laughs> this is a viewer who wants to know what this uh, particular weed is. Uh, comes up every year in her garden. She can't find them in the weed book. Uh, she's in Arcadia in Valley County. Um, this, this is probably one of the Daytura species. I'm going to say it's definitely a Solanaceae, but I, I'm not sure which one. I'm going to say it's probably a Daytura. Um, you can see a little tiny, I believe, it. it's either wilted. There's a <coughs> trumpet, white trumpet-shaped flower on there. If they were much larger, I would even say that it would be uh, gypsum weed or local weed, and then there would be some issues with the, with the, with the seeds and the, even the stems. So I'm going to say that's probably a Daytura species, um, and it's not a plant we want to pull it. All right, thank you, Rock. Uh, Kevin, we have a viewer who has hostas with issues that she thinks are disease, and the mm -hmm. question is whether it's environmental, and you can see kind of one leaf down there mm -hmm. at the bottom, and I'm not sure whether we have any, yep, there mm -hmm. we go, with that kind of chewed you know, up stuff. Yeah, it, uh, and chewed up sounds right. Actually, it's, it looks to me more like a, a slug or snail damage, and then you get some uh, dieback subsequently. So I'm guessing it's actually more of an entomology issue. Um, I think I've heard that you can put out like a tin flat like a pie tin a uh, flat beer and that'll attract the slugs and they'll die so that's a good control method but i don't think that's pathology i think that's an insect and then subsequent dieback all right excellent thanks kevin drink drink the beer drink the beer <laughs> <laughs> Half it, then. You kelly yeah. this is a uh, viewer in the omaha benson area mm -hmm. wonders what kind of a tree this is he thought it was tree of paradise and uh very pungent odor, attracts flies, comes up everywhere, loves the big one, doesn't like all the seedlings. Right, this is a tree of heaven, so he was somewhat close. <laughs> um, and it, it's Aelanthus is the genus name. And they are, they're a very weedy tree. They're a very fast growing tree. They're weak wooded, they're prolific seeders. Those flowers will turn into a cluster of Samaras that blow around and they are very prolific and, and they're considered a weed tree. So um, if they're in the lawn, you mow them to control the weed, but if you see them in, in garden beds, shrub borders, et cetera, the sooner you pull them before they get an established root, the better. All right. Free of heaven. Great, thank you, Kelly. Well, we have a couple of announcements tonight of things going on in the gardening world, and the first one is the Plymouth Flower and Photo Slash Art Show, July 11th at the Plymouth Community Center. We have a number on the screen for that one. And our second announcement is the Greater Omaha Iris Society sale, the 24th of July. We have a website on the uh, screen for that one. So a couple cool things in the gardening world. All right, just a couple minutes left, gang. This is, a gr this is the Grand Island question. Okay. Squash vine borer saw a moth in the garden today. Wonders how long it'll be before she starts laying those eggs. Could be happening any day if they're seeing the moth already. Okay, and should eight be dusted or sprayed? Will that help? If they're going to sp spring eight, uh, you can spray that, you probably get much better coverage than dust, dusting, avoid the flowers. All right, excellent. Rock, a viewer sprayed the soybean field with Roundup and then noticed a change in the garden. Every sim, everything seems to have been hit with drift. Uh, wondering whether the produce is safe to eat or what is the wait time? Well, I would, um, you know, we really don't have a whole lot of data on wait time on those sort of things in the situation they described. It's drift, so we're gonna assume the rate was relatively low. Any vegetables that were sprayed and came in contact with the with the drifting Roundup probably are not gonna be edible at this point in time. And it's, in terms of a waiting period, since there's technically not one, I would say if you get uh, the leaves and the other things removed and they'll die back, the leaves will die back. Anyway, you get those out of there, then the, then the new produced fruit and stuff is uh, 
um, safety. All right. but that's a guess, and technically, you know, you, you've got an off-label, got an off-label use there of, of some effect. So I'm not totally confident in that. And if somebody from the Nebraska Department of Ag calls in and says that was a really stupid answer, it was. <laughs> Okay, Kevin, on that note, uh, we have a viewer who has <laughs> healthy hydrangeas and then three stems all of a sudden just wilted. Mm -hmm. They're getting watered, AM Sun, they've had miracle Grow for the acid, this is the pink and blue ones. They've checked for borers, the leaves are healthy and they're... Mm. If they've checked for borers and there's nothing obvious on the stem or the base of the plant, then I would be concerned about a root issue. And when you have root issues, you can actually get you know, just one part of the plant to die back. So it could be a Pythium or a Phytophthora issue. We've had great weather conditions for that, super soggy soils. So it could be something like that. It's difficult to be able to uh, pull that plant up and observe the root. So you might want to just rogue the parts out that are dead um, and see if you can't salvage the rest of the plant. All right, thank you, Kevin. Kelly, we have a little under a minute. This is an Omaha viewer that wonders whether sand cherries grow on sand bars in the river. And if not, where do they grow, and are they something you can eat? Okay. Um, yes, I've never seen them on a sandbar out, out in the river. I suppose if it stayed dry, dry enough, long enough, they maybe could become established. But they do like sandy soils. Um, they're an awesome plant, and yes, you can eat. Uh, matter of fact, I have a jar of sand cherry jelly in my refrigerator right now, and it's a, a very delicious. <laughs> so they're... In, some newer cultivars, lower growing ones, um, beautiful plants to consider for, uh, for sandy soil or for a water-wise garden. All right, and they are uh, native to sandy sites, so <laughs> that old clay thing is probably not on their, uh, <laughs> on their radar screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and unfortunately, that is all the time we have for a good show of Backyard Farmer. Thanks to our panel for another show and to everyone who submitted questions and pictures. Helping us answer the phones tonight were Gladys Juring, George Edgar, Melissa Hacker, Kathy French, and Nebraska Extension Horticulture Assistant Terry James. From Finky Gardens was Luann Finky. Next time on Backyard Farmer, we'll return to the fairgrounds to feature how our state is leading the nation in growing food, and we'll see the construction of a real pivot and the interactive map of Nebraska. So good night, good gardening, and we'll see you all next week right here on Backyard Farmer.